Hi everyone, welcome to today's Media Mayhem. Today we're going to be talking about Scientology and the, how it was featured in the film Going Clear by Alex Gibney. And today's guest actually appears in that film along with other high-ranking members of Scientology. His name is Tom DeVocht, and he was one of the higher ranking members in the church who had a great deal of access and contact with David Miscavige and his wife Shelley. He also was a Sea Org um, executive who oversaw the construction and renovation of projects in Clearwater. Florida, and he's very familiar with the workings of Scientology, and we're going to talk a lot about his participation in the film Going Clear, and a lot about his experience in Scientology while he was in it, and what it was like to try to leave. So welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks very much. So I really enjoyed the film. I really enjoyed your commentary in the film and what you had to say about it. I think actually it's probably one of the first times I've really deeply understood how Scientology yeah. works and kind of its history yeah. and L. Ron Hubbard and there was sort of a minimal use of initials for different things yeah. that allowed exactly. some understanding. So how, how long were you in um, Scientology? Uh, in Scientology about 30 years. In the SEA organization, billion year contract, about 28. And when did you start? 12 years old, 1976 roughly. How did you get involved? Um, Steve Miller Band. Uh, I got, uh, my cousin played with the Steve Miller Band. Uh, they were number one on Casey Kasem's Top 40, and uh, he came to visit, and one by one, my sister, then my brother, then my mother. I was 74, 75, 77, I, or 76, I think I signed a uh, building year contract. Now, when were you, when you were approached to speak in the film and talk about Scientology, did you have reservations about doing it? Um, n yes, and, and not, Yes and no. I had spoken out on a St. Pete Times article. I had spoken out on CNN. <clears throat> Every time you speak out, there's repercussions. You, you, you know, PIs, this, that, the other thing. So you do hesitate a little bit. But no, I think that it, it was, uh, I knew, I hoped, and it did, would have a huge impact. And it really is. And I've, had, I've been contacted by many people, so I'm very glad I did it. Um, and it is totally worth uh, the pain that goes along with it. So let me ask you, um, what, and, and did you feel that the film did a really good job of explaining everything about Scientology? And was there anything that you think was kind of left out just for time considerations? Because the I, book I think is the, really. Yeah, no, I think the book covers much more detail, as is typical with any film, I believe. And, and But um, I think that it probably explains Scientology better than you would get an explanation if you asked a Scientologist. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I've done that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's impossible yes. to get an answer. Yes. What is Scientology? This film really does sum it up in, in about two hours. And, it, and, it, and uh, uh, I think it's very good in that respect, very good. And again, I think it gives you a foundation or gives others a foundation now to go, hey, it's okay to tell my story. It's okay to go into more detail. And people will understand those stories better now, I think. Well, Tom is part of the group of people that spoke in the film Going Clear, and all of them have been subjected to a highly publicized smear campaign, websites, all kinds of allegations made, nothing proven. But I just wanted to let you know that everybody's kind of already starting to pay a fairly high price for being a part of this film, including Alex Gibney. And, but I want to go back and talk to you, Tom, about joining Scientology, when you joined as a 12-year-old, and what it was like, and how much you worked, and, and, and what you actually had to do, and what your parents were doing at the same time. Sure. Um, I, uh, at 12, what did I start? I started in a hotel as a sort of bell captain. I worked from 8.30 in the morning until 11 o'clock at night. Um, and uh, it, bell captain type stuff. Very shortly thereafter, I became a member of this organization called the CMO, Commodore's Messenger Org, which were, you've seen the stories, it wasn't covered in the film, but you've seen the stories of the uh, very young individuals who worked directly for Hubbard and sort of were an internal police type of organization. I started with them and, they, and that was, they recruited the young guys. Um, so I started in that and did numerous things, anything from, uh, I'll give you another, because we were small little guys, we crawled up and down the chases in the Fort Harrison Hotel, 10 stories, at 12 years old, patching holes for a fire inspection 
we do that all day long. I mean, all day long. And that was owned long. by Scientology? Or yeah, oh yeah, that was their organization. So it, it was a lot of labor, a lot of, um, and then in weird positions of being in charge of many, many people as a, as a kid. As you a 12-year-old, I mean? yeah. in charge you're, of adults? Adults and other kids. Um, yeah, I mean, at, at probably 14, I could walk around, yeah, let's go 15, I could walk around and go, RPF to an adult, RPF being the Rehabilitation Project for us. It, it was, it was you, in retrospect, pretty crazy, pretty, pretty. Uh, and pretty people wild. would do what you said? Yeah, for sure. Now, yeah. were you being educated? Were you living with your family? Were you I, by yourself? I went, um, I went to school, I think it was fourth or fifth grade, maybe for about two months. Um, and then uh, I was asked to go to New York to move the organization from 73rd and Columbus to 46th and Broadway, and I quit school, and I went, and uh, that was it, never went back. At what age? 14. So, so how do they get away with, and somebody was asking me this on the Facebook page, how do they get away with working children for that many hours, and how do they get away with not educating you without a truant officer yeah, showing and, up? And I think does, early on in done? the 70s, that was happening, and it was just sort of happening, and, and it wasn't, being scrutinized. I think that since it's being scrutinized, they tighten things up on that. But as soon as they get the IRS tax exemption, that organization is protected by the government beyond imagination. I mean, so really then, yeah. protected. I mean, so basically, in terms of the labor laws, everything is related to religion. So it's they a say church. it's religious it do, freedom that's exactly for you right. not, for the children not to be going to school, but that's they're exactly getting a religious right. education. That's exactly right. All, all of it. I, the FBI, when they interviewed me, asked me, would you take us through, this is, I'm jumping ahead, but Go to ahead. give you an example, would you take, if we raided the property in Hemet, California, Golden Air Productions International Management, would you take us through and show us where to look? And I said, absolutely, let's go, let's do it tomorrow. And we talked about that for a minute, and then she asked, do you think it would, would work? Do you think we'd find things? I said, you absolutely find things, but everybody there would tell you, no, 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 we're doing this, this is on our own accord, and so forth. And because it is protected as a church, you can't, there's nothing you can do. I mean, it, if they're saying that, and the, that's Even the, the punitive it, matters. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's over. I mean, you're, you're done. So we were talking about Hemet. Where, could you just tell the audience where that is and what went down there? When you're being interviewed by the FBI, what were they asking you about? What were they doing there? Okay, I, I wasn't in Hemet when they interviewed me, but I was in Clearwater, Florida, but in the FBI office. But it was in association with what had gone down in Hemet. Yeah, and they were asking about Hemet, and, and uh, that's where the hole was, et, et cetera. And they were asking about that, and, and uh, Hemet is in right outside of Riverside between here and San Jacinto. Um, so they were asking me, if we went in and did a raid, would you show us where different things are? Because I was explaining to them what happened in Building 50, that was the RTC building that I, I re-renovated for Miscavige, and what happened in the hole, the trailers, and, and where to find different things. And they asked, would you show us around? And I said, absolutely, Let, let's go. I was ready to do it right now, you know. Um, but uh, then the, she asked, do you think it would be worthwhile doing it? I said, no. I said, I think that you're gonna walk in there, you're gonna find everything that we've told you is gonna happen, and the people will stand up and go, no, this is what we, we want to be doing. Yeah, this is what we do. We're, this isn't being forced on us, and you know. And as a church, it's it's protected in that way, and you can't. I had talked to many people before that even, and they said, no, if you're sitting there doing it willingly, and nobody's made a call or, or you know, complained and that sort of thing. There's nothing they can do. So the FBI comes in, and this place in Hammett is a place where people were being punished for not doing things in, in accordance with Scientology procedures or, thing, or for, frankly, just uh, angering David Miscavige. Mm -hmm. And Tom, what your job was is that you helped to build this place, and then you helped to build certain portions of it and turn it into a prison for him at his instructions, right? I mean, there were certain... Well, I mean, well, even though they voluntarily, people are voluntarily staying within this place. Well, that, I didn't... You, I didn't do that. Okay, <laughs> let me tell go ahead, you. Okay, yeah, let me, okay. let me tell you. The place was already pretty much a prison camp when I got. Now I was there in '83 to, uh, yeah, '83 to '86, and it wasn't. There were not even fences up. But when I got back there um, in 2001, I mean, there's fences with uh, barbed wire. 
not barbed wire, they're razor wire. I mean, and, and cameras internally oriented and, and you, you know, are you, is it meant to keep you in or keep people, <laughs> you know, from coming in? But, um, and they were building these buildings called the birthing buildings that, that they're dormitories for the staff and they had been incomplete for six, seven years and Miscavige's building, building 51, uh, I think they show a couple pictures of it and going clear, um, was, had been renovated and then torn apart and I had to tear it all apart again because it was done so badly and that's a whole different story but um, I'm rambling and I don't know what No, I was I asking you basically that this is an area where people were being kept oh, yeah, and the, being and the disciplined prison, in yeah. a prison kind of situation. And, and uh, you, you say that and I'll tell you something and again I'm jumping forward but one of the last things I was told by Miscavige when he was reading to me my declare as a suppressive person was that I didn't finish the, those birthing buildings, the, the uh, dormitories, so that he could lock people up inside the property and keep them from blowing, which means leaving, and talking out badly against him. And I thought, can I use foul language? Yes. <laughs> How about it? I said, can you, I, what the, I, it's the last reason in the fucking world I would do those renovations to begin with. But um, he asked you to. No, I was being declared. I was being expelled from the church for not getting them done for that reason. Okay. And, it, and that just puts, tells you his state of mind is, yeah, I want to lock everybody up. And that is, that's what he complained about full time. So, Let's yes, that base him. is a prison camp. Okay. Let's talk about him. Okay, so that place was a prison camp. Yeah. You didn't help him. You didn't finish the job. So, ultimately, you were being declared a suppressive person. We'll get there. But let's talk about, I mean, you're being thrown out yeah. or leaving, and then you're going to be declared a suppressive person. But let me ask you this. Let's talk about your relationship. When did you first meet Ms. Cavage, and what was the nature of the relationship at the very beginning, and then how did things change? All right, the very first time I met Ms. Cavage was October 83, I think. I had just, I had been, I was in Florida. I had been sent over the rainbow, they called it, disappeared in the middle of the night, and ended up in uh, Hemet, in, that, in the property there. Very different at that point. Um, and I happened to run into Miscavige and we talked for a minute and he said, hey, would you like to come to a uh, Chargers game, football game? I went to the game. That was the first time I met him and pretty intense guy, a um, little into himself it seemed. I can tell you now in retrospect, but okay, we went to it and I met his wife and a couple others and we went to the game and came back and that was the end of my dealing for probably a couple of years, but over time I'd see him and run into him. Progressively I got to know him a little bit more just in occasional meetings, but then I went to Clearwater and I took over, no, one day I'm told in 96, I think it is, yeah, no, 86, sorry, I'm told Miscavige, who's the top dog, has said that one of three people can do this particular project to set up the IAS, the, the International Association of Scientologists, long, complicated, explain all the details of it, right. but it was one of three people and I was one of them. The other one was a, the executive director of International and the other one was the commanding officer of something and I was the third one and I thought, that's weird. I mean, out of all these people, he's picking me, you know, but whatever. So I went and I did that and then I ended up back in Florida after I finished that full time to run the property. I mentioned that because then my relation with him became he would come down with all the other uh, executives of Scientology, and they would do these international events, and we did them in the auditorium. Well, over time, it got stranger and stranger. First, they're all on a first name basis. Then, and they're all staying in the same place. Then, Dave is telling me, why are you listening to that guy? Who's my direct boss? You should be listening to me. Then, uh, uh, a few months later, another event. Now, they're all calling Mr. Kevin, sir, and, and, and panicked around him. And then, a few years later, they're flinching and that it, it you could just see progressively Miscavige was beating these people down somehow he was taking all the cream off the international events and, and doing it all himself and it became more and more about him even more so than about Hubbard so you could just sort of see a progression happening there uh, that was that was rather scary Lisa McPherson time period Miscavige is in Clearwater full-time Lisa McPherson, I guess, yeah, I don't have to explain. Well, that. you don't, I mean, but basically was a high-ranking member of a she, she was a, pub, a parishioner and, and ended up uh, dying in the facilities due to being mistreated. And, and 
yeah. Um, Miscavige had been there, and I'm renovating all these auditing rooms and so forth, the counseling rooms, and all of them have cameras in them. Uh, and we just set that up. Well, Miscavige, I, I, I think I brought this up elsewhere, but Miscavige was in a booth, I don't know, 20 by 20, with all these cameras and, or, or monitors and could watch all these. Uh, all the different auditing. All the different auditing. You see the person sitting there, the, the being audited, the auditor, the meter, everything. And for training purposes, you know. Um, so Miscavige is watching every session with Lisa McPherson in it, personally. He is personally what they call case supervising these. I mean, writing, this is what you need to tell her and, 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 uh, and do with her and so forth. Well, she ends up having a car accident, flipping out, stripping her clothes off, and ends up in a psychiatric ward. They grab her out of there. The church grabs her out, puts her in. Daily reports are going to Miscavige every day about her in the room, okay, by his staff. Nobody else could touch it. This was really super like sensitive she dies and folders are rushed around taking a la from clearwater and, and shredded and changed up and 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 uh um so there there's another experience with him and you're going this guy thinks and now from an in from a uh, a member's point of view okay i'm still pretty dedicated at this point but i'm thinking miscavige actually thinks he knows more than Hubbard. He's changing things. Did He's, you find that at the time to be offensive? I mean, yeah, I found I, that I mean, disturbing. This is that, something that people ask a lot: is that while you guys are in Scientology, yeah. like what do you question things? Do, no. Are there things? No, I you mean, don't. You don't. They're, they're, and that's part of the danger with this cult. Is you've got this thing called keeping Scientology working. We could go on for hours, okay. Alice, and trying oh. to explain it, but. Keeping Scientology working was a Hubbard policy that says, look, the only thing that works, period, is, is, is uh, Scientology exactly how I've written it. Don't think about anything okay. else. Don't do anything else. That's it. Okay. okay. So Miscavige is getting a stranger. He, uh, he oversees. You watch him oversee the death of one of the parishioners, which yeah. became a very big story for, but, for those of you who don't huge. know. And then, and it's actually mentioned, you know, in the film, in the film. but but then what happens next but with so him from and a, your from relationship? A, from an yep. a, uh, insider's point of view, that's getting weird, because now he's taking the, the sacred technology, even the weird crap, the, the Xenu stuff and all that. I started on a particular level of that, and he's telling me, no, 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 you don't say that out loud to yourself. You, you, but Hubbard's bulletin said you say it out loud. Oh. I know it sounds... So he starts to change some of Hubbard's policies. Yeah, so you're really starting you, to think. Because like, you're fine with not questioning anything that Hubbard has to say, but who is this guy telling exactly, you? Exactly, at okay. that time. And here he is. And meanwhile, so he does this stuff with Lisa McPherson, and she dies. I mean, yeah, I'm looking up this guy at that point. You know what I mean? Okay, so years go on. 2001, I mean, I'm hearing him talk about the entire crew, 750 people here in Hemet. Uh, are suppressive people, meaning they are out to get Scientology, they're out to get Hubbard, they're not with the program. Scientology has a datum that says 2% are suppressive in a group and 98% uh, are good. He had it completely switched around. Okay. I am, you know, the only one that's not suppressive, everybody else is. And I kept hearing this stuff and going, wow, this is it. And I'd hear him on the phone yelling and screaming. And then. Uh, I had renovated these offices right next to my offices in Clearwater, in the West Coast building. And I would hear Mike and Marty being thrown around the room. I mean, quite literally. Marty Rathman, and, Rathman and, and, Mike and Mike Rinder, Rinder. Yeah, okay. who were working with him at, the, at that time uh, on the, going, uh, on the um, Lisa McPherson case. So physically being thrown around, even though they're yeah. larger, so they're letting him do whatever they want. Yeah, and I, uh, yeah, and I get... I get uh, um, called in one day and said, you know, there's going to be protesters. This is around the time, same time period. Tom, I want you to get all the sidewalks. We owned Clearwater, okay? All the sidewalks around our properties, which is everything, torn up so that they can't be on the sidewalks. Go to the FDOT, Florida Department of Transportation, and get it done. <laughs> I'm thinking, are you fucking nuts? I go to the FDOT, and they're, go of course, going, are you fucking nuts? I come back, and I said, you can't do it. 
I've got barricades that, that the other day. He dives across the room, grabs my uh, necktie, and pushes it up into my, I can't breathe. I'm thinking, what the hell is going on? That's the first time he actually physically. Put hands on you. Yeah, and I'm thinking, OK, he's under a lot of pressure. The whole case and this and that and the other thing. All right. Does he apologize? Oh, no. Hell no. But uh, no, and I was in severe trouble at that point, and, you know, and, and, and might as well have been another suppressive person. It was crazy. But, but you know, the next day it could be, hey, brother, how are you doing? But uh, okay, so that happened then. 2001, I get, extra, I get extracted from uh, Clearwater. Mainly Shelley arranged that, Shelley Miscavige. Get out there, go to Hemet, finish our building. I get to their building, and uh, it, it, from a construction point of view, it was a nightmare. And I don't know if you want me to go into detail. Is this that, the centerpiece that what he was trying to make beautiful, so where this, Tom Cruise was going to stay? Uh, exactly. This is his building. It's about 40,000 square feet, maybe a little bit less. Um, built from the ground up, badly. Um, okay. Stone, steel. Very high tech looking. And he wants he you to constantly, fix it. Constantly, yeah, wants me to go in and finish it for 2.7 million. That's all we got left to do on a 2.7 million dollars. I get there, the roof is peeling off, the walls are cracked, everything had been ripped out that had already been put in. I mean, it, it was being built from 274 different renderings, not plans. I mean, it was just a total nightmare from a construction point of view. And, and I guess they've got some video out with people talking about me saying I overspent this. That. I sent daily reports to that. Okay. Prick. But anyway, um, so now he arrives. It, it's, he's still doing a McPherson case in Clearwater. He finally arrives back, and, and uh, again, this is, and cut me off if I'm going into too much detail. But here he goes, okay, let me show you, and I've been there for about a year now, ripping this building apart and redoing it at, at extreme cost. I mean, you don't undo something and redo it cheaply, but. He goes, let me show you why I can't stay on this property. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. You got, sent me up here a year ago to build this, redo this building, and you can't stay on the property. But whatever, not, not even a point. So we go to this uh, qualifications building where staff members are doing their training and, and, and processing and that sort of thing. And he's calling them out one at a time. Hey, and some of them I knew, some of them didn't. But he'd go, hey, Allison, come over here. And as you get close, you'd, you'd flinch which was weird. I'm, I'm witnessing everyone. I'm sort of flinching like he's going to hit him. Sort of strange. But then he would go, now Allison here, let's go to somebody else. <laughs> now Barbara here, she, uh, Tom, she, and I'm going to go into, but I'm just going to tell you, she had her finger up her butt and was masturbating and this, that, the other thing. And of course, Barbara is fucking white, sweating and going, oh my God. And I'm going, Dude, I need to hear this. And how the fuck do you know that? But we go through probably 50 people. Where he tells you embarrassing details about their personal. Oh, still, like, okay. Not, so, not even what was embarrassing, just sort of like, what, how, why would you know that? You know what I mean? The point being, he, anytime he would walk around the property and somebody would not stand up and stand at attention or didn't say yes, sir, and salute to him, they would be thrown in on the meter, that thing and asked, what are you doing? What's, what what uh, have you done against Miscavige? What have you done against Hubbard? And of course, th these people are in a cult. They're not doing shit. They're not, you know, there's no, you can't have sex with somebody unless you're married. There's, there's nothing to come up with, you know what I mean? But so all they could come up with was stupid crap like masturbation. So he was telling you the personal information from their auditing sessions that he'd been watching. So I find out yeah. they're doing staff meetings with 750 people. All their peers, hey, Barbara, stand up. Tell the group what you did. So everybody I was meeting was cowed and it was... And frightened. Frightened beyond belief. People now, tell I me this other thing that you told me also that Miscavige, because it, it begins to sound to me, if you hear enough about David Miscavige, that his paranoia is pathological. And perhaps I know that Scientology doesn't approve of, of uh, psycho you know, drugs for psychi psychiatric reasons, <laughs> but he totally sounds like he was pathologically paranoid. And very, certainly very when much. it comes to the Thetan issue, which you told me about. I'll explain and that. Did you yeah. explain that, what he thought? Yeah, and I understood Hubbard was very much like this too, which I never met Hubbard, but but um, a, a few very interesting conversations with Miscavige. One that really stuck out with, for me was uh, he was 
extremely afraid of children. And I never really understood until he explained to me. And you've got to sort of go back to the basic beliefs of the church. These guys believe that there are these people dumped in, you know, the whole story from the movie. So all these individual beings are stuck to our bodies and to when ourselves and when we're born. And, and, we're, and that's what they do is they try to exercise these and get rid of them. Well, and they're called thetans. Thetans. And they're called body thetans because they're stuck to the body or clusters, which are a bunch of them stuck to the body <laughs> together, okay? And you're supposed to get rid of them by, these, by talking to them, um, much like my grandmother used to talk to herself. Anyway, um, <laughs> so uh, they actually believe the population is growing because the Scientologists are getting rid of these body thetans and they're going off and picking up these bodies. That's where these people are coming from. These, these things that are stuck to you, these other beings, thetans, are degraded. They're a the lot of times suppressive, that sort of thing. I know that sounds ridiculous, but think like you really think that. Miscavige truly believes that, okay? Kids are these previous body thetans. They scare him. They're probably a suppressive person. In the Sea Organization, you're not allowed to have kids. So that was why, probably. I, I believe it is, yeah. yeah. And, we don't, and people thought that was because, so you could work all the time, but there was also, obviously, a, a and dislike and, you, and a distrust of children. Totally, and if you think about it, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. That religion could not expand without having kids. But anyway. Um, so it was rather that. counterintuitive. Yeah, yeah. right? Uh-huh. But uh, another point. I built another place for him, that, uh, uh, an apartment for him. He would not allow anybody within about 150 feet of him because he was afraid their BTs and clusters would jump onto him. Or jump down. Or jump down. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry. Yes, exactly. Yes. But okay. the, the point being, it's, it's a very, this is how the man thinks and what he sees when he's looking at Tom Cruise or you or I or, you know what yeah, I mean? You said so some he, interesting things. There has been so much discussion about Tom Cruise being the spokesperson for Scientology and that he personally has, it influenced a lot of people to join the church, and therefore, in this documentary, there is a lot of discussion about how much Tom Cruise knew about the really negative and terrible parts of Scientology. Yeah. A lot of what you're talking about, yeah. the physical abuse, the mental abuse, the uh, forcing of people to have abortions in the Sea Org, or talking them into having abortions, right. um, and those types of things. So you were really close to Miscavige. Yeah. What were his conversations with you like about Tom Cruise? Um, do you, strange. Um, yeah, and how much do you think Tom Cruise knew about everything else that was well, going on? Well, let, let me ask you something. And I had somebody tweet me and say, well, wait a minute, Tom Cruise and these guys are, don't know that. And I wrote back and I said, how do you know it? I mean, Tom Cruise could watch the goddamn film. He could watch, go on the internet. I mean, you can't say they don't know it. They, it can't be hidden from them. Although inside you're told not to see those things and that sort of thing, but it is not justifiable in, in completely unreasonable to think that Tom, John Travolta, and the rest of them don't know anything. They know, or at least they could find out. Okay. Just let me start out with that. But yeah, uh, Let's talk about Cruise, Miscavige and Cruz because yeah. that relationship has been the topic of a lot of speculation in the media, yep. and it's a big topic in the film. Yeah, and I, 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 the number one question I get asked, because I mentioned that I was sitting there when Cruz was being audited by Marty Rathbun, audited being his confessionals and that sort of thing. Reports would be sent to Miscavige every night, and, and Miscavige would sit in the room, we would drink scotch, and he would read some of these out loud and talk about Cruz's sex life and this, that, the other thing. I've been asked repeatedly, what did he say, and I will not say it, because that's the church's thing. They do that. I would never do that. But I will tell you, um, and I don't know the whole previous stuff, I can tell you that I went to the, my relationship in the beginning or, or where I started seeing Cruz involved was after or during Vanilla Sky. Uh, I went to the uh, um, uh, premiere with Miscavige. And that's when they sort of got reunited after he'd been away in, for a while. He'd been in England filming right. the film with Nicole and then they came back to the United States and 
during the filming, he didn't have very much contact with Miscavige, right. and so Miscavige, at least according to you, was trying to get Tom more involved in the church again and back sort of into his, under his control, right. and began to initiate a series of things that also are mentioned in the film, which included wiretapping of Nicole Kidman's conversations and also feeding certain information and also in doing extra auditing of Tom Cruise by Marty Rathbone, right? right. Exactly. Okay, so. So you go to this premiere, and and what do you see? And what do you see? In Long terms story of that? short, yeah. you could see. And it's funny. I was talking to another Scientology celebrity that was there at that premiere, and and I noticed that they were just sort of poo-pooed, like whatever. You don't even matter anymore. And and they felt that way too. I, I just confirmed that today, as a matter of fact. But and that's what I observed. I mean, he was completely into Cruz. Um, so. Long story short, we end up down in the in the garage of this place, and Cruz is showing him his uh, uh, um, SUV that he just got customized. Blah 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 goes on. He pulls out. Cruz pulls out. Um, Scavage turns around, and goes, "What a punk! What a punk! I mean, my SUV is way better than his." And just and got into this role. Sound like a little you know ten year old complaining about yet. Up to that point, he's raving about how you know Tom's the greatest guy, and he's so, such a close friend. It was just it, he might as well pull out a knife and stab Tom when he turned around. But but um, so that was weird. And then he said, you know, Penelope's got to go. She looked at me funny, and she's too Catholic. And and uh, so you could tell really the importance to Dave Miscavige about Tom Cruise was two things: the money that he will generate by getting people in, and making Dave look better, okay. if that makes sense. And, what did you and, think about the issue of the girlfriend? If David Miscavige, this is something that didn't quite make sense to me, wants Tom to be completely under his control, does, why bother about who he's dating? Is that because he wants whoever he's dating to also be under his control? Yes, or? you, you okay. have in Scientology a, a thing called PTSSP, potential trouble source, suppressive person. If, if um, his girlfriend was a suppressive person, like I am, then she would be telling him, hey, Dave's not a good guy, and there's something wrong with this church, and hey, man, maybe we should watch Going Clear. And that would be a problem because that could pull Cruz away. And so Cruz would be a potential trouble source. So yeah, if that's happening, they got to shun that person and make sure they disconnect them from Tom, and then they can maintain control over Tom. Okay, and so he starts to badmouth him. Uh, he does. He actively works to make that marriage troubled by right. what? I mean, Nicole and Tom. That I'm. I was not privy part to. of or privy okay. to. I mean, I've heard what you've heard. I've seen what you've seen, and I, I can tell you that that Miss Cabbage and Shelley both told me that they really hated her and that she was an SP and so forth. But I was not. That was after the fact. But I was not there for that show, Ken. Let me ask you this quick question also about religion, because when you go to Scientology and you go to the Celebrity Center, they tell you that Scientology is completely compatible with other religions. Right. So why would David Miscavige see being too Catholic as problematic? Is it not compatible? Again, no, it's not compatible. I mean, again, you got that KSW thing. That's it. It's the only thing that works. Any, if you do think about anything else, you're out of order. You need to be right back in there and do not... This so is, if you're yeah, Catholic and you want to go to Mass, that would be in conflict with Scientology? Completely. And they said, no, 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 no. But that's how they bring people in. Uh, but completely. I, there's no way you're going to find a Scientologist who also goes to another church or does something else. Okay. So we there. there's also little mention in the film about Mimi Rogers and none about Katie Holmes. And I wondered what you knew about Katie's, how she came to be in the church and what was happening at that time. And she came in, I guess, in 2005, and you were going out around that time? I was gone. Oh, you were um, gone. So. Yeah. I, I, what I know is that when they were doing the recruiting for somebody to be his girlfriend, I was in, uh, this is the end of 2004, I think. I was in New York trying to finish up the Church's renovations there. Um, uh, second time I got beat by Miscavige. But I get there and he comes and he says, Cruz is coming. I want you to keep an eye out for the best looking women you can find that are at the event and get their names and numbers because I'm trying to get Tom a, a decent girlfriend. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was just, it was weird. I'm serious, man. Okay, okay. But uh, um, 
Yeah, that's, that's as much as I know about that. I know that, that um, I've talked to somebody recently, and you know, the whole thing about Shelly disappearing. And the story that I heard, and this is somebody, I'm not gonna say their name because they're under the radar, so to speak. They don't, they, they are out, but not talking. Well, I think, I think they might now that the film's out, but that was there in, uh, on a couple of conversations with uh, Shelly and, and uh, people who were involved with them and, and uh, with uh, Miscavige and, and uh, Cruz. But I'm trying to say this without saying. Um, so here's the bottom line why Shelley disappeared. And I, and I do truly believe that this, if you understand Miscavige, this is why. Shelley got to a point where she was fed up with the Cruz Miscavige relationship. David Miscavige was trying to get buildings right around here uh, by author services, their property. They've got a uh, apartment complex behind that that they had bought. Miscavige took it over and said, I want it renovated for Tom and I. And because Tom is going to live there, I'm going to live there. And Shelley finally went, dude, this is, it's too much. I, I don't agree. Go find him a goddamn house somewhere else. But this is too much. Um, and so. Yeah. Are you implying then that they were having a different kind of relationship? No, I'm not implying that. Just at all. that the I'm, terms all of I'm implying, yeah, I don't think Cruz is gay. <laughs> I, just, I don't. I and I did sit there and listen to stuff. I mean, and who, truthfully, who, who the fuck yeah. cares? Okay. Right. But, well, but, I mean, the only reason I think I, I, that that I, it becomes an issue is the whole issue. If of, it was Tom and him. Well, no, <laughs> but it, but there is the issue of Scientology, and I guess I'll take this moment to ask uh, that yes. question and their attitudes towards gay people. Yes. And what is that? Because they Hubbard have been on they, the record. Hubbard said that they are, uh, are criminal, that they are dangerous, and they should all be put on a boat, taken out to sea, and blown up. I mean, he was serious about that. Uh, and did they uh, talk to you about that, if anybody? It's in books. I mean, it's like, you know what I mean? It was very frowned on. I mean, people went to the RPF for thinking about it, you know? Um, really bad. And now they've revised, and that's why I believe they... And people went, so people went to that prison in Hammett for ta ta thinking about being homosexual. They went or to even what's called a Rehabilitation Project Force, right. whether, whether it was in London or, I mean, in England or here, wherever okay. they had these, these things all over the place. And, they, and, and uh, yeah, so... Okay, so now you said that was the second time that you'd gotten beaten by Miscavige. Mm. And, and to me, I mean, that's an interesting thing. So he, he, how many times did he have to physically abuse you before you decided to leave? The third, third time, I think, was the, the final one. And, and you know, I, I was, uh, the second time was in New York, and, and I had, um, I had uh, gotten there two weeks before the renovations were done and it wasn't even close to being done and it wasn't even my damn project but somehow I was the one that was the asshole for not getting it done so I flew in there and was up for two weeks straight and he arrived and I'm walking him through and I showed him an area I said look this is not the final furniture because I couldn't get it on time so I put in temporary furniture next thing I know he punches me in the face and then punches me in the chest a few times I'm like whoa 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 what the hell but anyway no sleep nothing I was like, oh, whatever. But uh, the third time was, uh, uh, and I think Marty talks about it, and I talk about it on Going Clear. It was, I was renovating the uh, CD manufacturing plant for the church in Hemet. And I was in somewhere working on it, and I got somebody rushed up to me and said, COB, chairman of the board, wants to see you right now. And so I followed him into this room, and there were 7,500 of uh, my friends and the other people who were in the hall, including Mike and Marty. And uh, Miscavige asked me something as I was walking up, and I really didn't understand the question. And I must have frowned or something, and whap in the face, and then punched me and knocked me down on the ground and started kicking me, and it was like, and what goes through it? I know it sounds weird, and I go, I hate saying this on TV. I sound like a complete wimp. But it wasn't like that. I mean, it, it was, actually, but you are so mentally controlled by that time. You, you know, this is, I mean, the equivalent of the Pope doing it to you. You want to retaliate, but on the other hand, it is the Pope. And also you got 75 to 100 people behind him who are just as screwed up as you are and probably would p pummel you if you even, you know, raise your voice at him. So it was very strange. But that particular incident did, I sort of went, uh, okay, this is, this is too much. And it wasn't long after that that he, he read that 
thing to me and said, I'm a suppressive person. I said, good, that's my ticket. I'm out. And, uh, so he decided that you were a suppressive person and that's why you left? Um, he, no, that's not why I left. It was the, the, was the, the whole, all of that stuff was going on. And let me tell you something. I left in May 2005. The stories I heard about how it got after that are, I can't believe anybody stayed. You know what I mean? Particularly, anyway, I can't believe anybody stayed. It got really crazy. And it was bad enough when I was there. It just got to the point where you went, okay, I've seen Miscavige say and do the things he's done. I've, I've seen how he's treating people. I've seen that you're trapped and so forth. I'm not, and, and, and it's all I've known. I mean, it really is all I've known. I've gone nowhere. I'm not educated. I don't have credentials to get a job, I, but it was so bad that there was no other decision than to walk the hell out of there. I could not contribute another day to it. And, and it was my decision being hit by Miscavige and that sort of thing and having gotten sort of close to him actually that he would turn on me like that. Um, Do you think that the downfall, uh, I mean the problems that Scientology is having are related to Miscavige's treatment of the top people that helped him? I think Hubbard stuff is, I think Miscavige is doing a lot of what Hubbard taught. But I think that, yes, I think that Miscavige has taken it and, and, and gotten so crazy and power hungry with it uh, uh, that it's, yeah, he's, he has, if the Church of Scientology ever had a chance He's taken that away from it. It is, it is the end of it. I am sure of it now. I would give it, you know, they've got a lot of money. But, and they're doing all their buildings and stuff like that. But I invite anybody to go and look at a church for Scientology anywhere around there. They've got so many all over the place. Go walk in in the middle of the day. There's nobody in them. And, and, I'm sorry. Yeah, and? Yeah, yeah, who would? Who would walk in them? I mean, their public relations are terrible. And it is, it's, I think it is definitely miscavaged driving that boat right now. He's, got, he's, uh, he's whacked out just enough Now, when, when you it. decide to leave Scientology and you leave, and you explain this to me, but just so that everybody at home understands, and we, we heard some of this from Tori, but the, the disconnection from people, what were you left with when you left there? I mean, in terms of friends or family? Nothing. Who was left I mean, behind? Who's I, still in there, in your family? Uh, my sister was left in there. Uh, and her, her husband and two kids. Um, and I walked out, and, and just to finish that story real quick, I walked out purposely. I did not blow, escape, or anything like that. I wanted to make a point when I left that, hey, you can walk out. But, uh, and particularly to Miscavige, hey, you know. But, but uh, my sister was left in there, my, uh, um, her kids and her husband and won't talk to me. She actually somehow arranged, shortly after I left my father, who I'd never seen. I'd never really met him because he was a suppressive person, but he lived in Belgium and he was never involved in the church. Um, I met him, I think first or second time or something, shortly after I left. Well, Nancy, my sister, had somehow gotten out on a vacation or something to go see him as well. So we ran into each other and she said, I, I just want you to take an hour and tell me what happened. And I'm thinking she really wants to know for the church, but whatever. So I tell her, well, I find out a week after she went back, she had gone into the RPF, the Rehabilitation Project Force, for four years for talking to me. And, but that, again, tells you the state of mind. It shocks me, on one hand, that she would stay and do that. I never went to the RPF in 20, the 28 years I was in there, but it shocks me that she would do that. But on the other hand, it shows the power of the brainwashing and everything that's going on. I mean, for talking, you know what I mean? And it's a really interesting thing, too, that while you were there and you were working, what kind of contact did you have with your mom? And what happened if you got ill when you were 12 years old? Yeah, ill, okay, as a kid in the C organization, you're treated as an adult, period. And you're not even treated as an adult, you're treated as a Thetan in, in Scientology. You're a spiritual Bad. being. No, not the bad one. You're, you're a spiritual being just like anybody else is a spiritual being. It doesn't matter what your age is, that sort of thing. You got sick, you went to isolation. Isolation was a room with 20, 25 people in it and in bunks. Everybody was sick and they were, got separated from everybody else so that nobody else got sick. You got vitamins and somebody would check on you maybe once a day. Your mom didn't check on you. She's working. You know? There was no, hey, you okay? Let me, you know, there was no, no family thing like that at all. And you were bad and considered uh, um, 
to be, you know, uh, you, it wasn't a good thing to be sick. You were treated like you were bad for getting sick. And, and that's just sort of how it was. So as a child, yeah, it was very much, you didn't have a childhood anymore and you didn't have... Um, so who's raising you? You're raising yourself. Yeah, and as a working, matter of fact, in, in the position job. I was, and I was, I was put in charge of 50 kids at the age of, I would think I was 13. And those 50 kids, we all lived in dorms, and I met with them every day and told them what we're going to do, and we'd go clean or whatever, and, and that was it. I mean, there was no parents involved. There was a parent time for an hour a day after dinner that I think went on for a couple of years, but then even that was eliminated. There now, did you get, you got married while you were there as well, and what, did, what was that like? Um, strange. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can't sleep with anybody, you can't, I mean, there's nothing, you can't Is do Is that not anything. really happening? It happened occasionally, but if you did it, you go to the RPF. Okay. So, so if you get caught, and everybody's an informer, so. Then we'd all joke, you know, maybe it's worth it, but, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, and everybody's an informer, including okay. the person you're trying to do it with, but. <laughs> But, um, uh, yeah, we got, I got uh, married, and, and uh, strange story. Um, I got married, her name is Jennifer Linson. Her, her, husband, her dad is uh, Art Linson, a producer in Hollywood. But, um, she's uh, still? She's in. She is like Miscavige's right-hand man type of thing in there, and she'd become that and fallen off, and it's very strange. It's a whole other thing I could go on about, but... Um, so when you decide? We got married yeah. in 83 and uh, big wedding, got married and I went, I got sent to Clearwater, Florida, I had mentioned that, to take over there. Jenny stayed here at the author services. Miss Scavenge one day comes and says, God damn, your wife's not here. He's in Clearwater at this point. I'll get her down here. I'm a good guy, I'm your friend. So he sends her down. She's there for about, I don't know, maybe a year. Miscavige comes down again. Again, this is sort of off the subject, but it gives you a good idea. And I get called. I just finished renovating the apartments for Miscavige. And he says, uh, I'm not that close with him at this point. And uh, I get called and say, hey, would you like to come over for a beer? And I'm thinking, beer? You don't drink either. Yeah, I'd love a beer. So I go over to the apartment, and he's sitting about where you are, and Shelly's sitting on a couch behind him. And he goes, Tom, let me ask you something. I take my first sip of the beer, and he goes, can you imagine being married and not having sex with your wife. And I'm thinking, guy to guy, okay, it's sort of weird. And I go, no, <laughs> I go, no, I, I, if I could, I'd do it two, three times a day if I could. And he goes, huh. and Shelly rolls her eyes like, oh God, wrong answer. I'm done with my beer, I'm not, I'm not done, but he goes, okay, thanks. Like that was it, okay, leave the beer. <laughs> I go out and I go, God, I did something wrong. The next day, Jenny was shipped off. New York, whatever, and, and so out of a 19-year marriage, I saw her, I've calculated, probably in a total time of about four years. And she did hang with Miscavige and Shelley and all those guys, and I, from what I've heard, he's still his, sort of his henchman, and she sort of liked it. But, but um, And there were times when Shelley, very, near the very end, would come to me and go, get your wife away from my husband. And I'm going, Shelly, I'm never with you guys. I mean, what, am, what am I supposed to do about it? She's crying and everything. It, it got very strange. Did she end up being sent away because she objected to them having an apartment building together? I, she, she objected to the relationship. There's something in Scientology called what they, and it's not a common term, but it's other fish to fry. She finally saw, hey, Miscavige, you are screwing things up. You are so into your relationship. Look, here's the Pope, okay, of, of the church. With Tom Cruise, was he, did he marry Tom Cruise or was he Tom Cruise's best man? It's just sort of weird that he would be the best man as the head of a religion. To me, you know what I mean? I go, what the hell? But I think Shelley saw that finally and went, no, 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 no. You're, you're not moving him into the same apartment complex. You're not, not that they were having a relation, but it got so weird and Miscavige was so into the bikes and the this and the that and being like Tom and Tom being like him that he was being distracted from her point of view of, hey, let's move on with this religion. And she said something. And that was it for her. Then so nobody can really disagree with him? Oh, absolutely not. Or 
they're sent away. Now, here's, I, we're actually running out of time, but I wanted to ask you one last thing about the whole idea of a successor to Ms. Cabbage. Is he grooming anybody? No, we and, talked about that, he and I, and, and, he, and he, you know, he would bring it up once a month. Oh, God, who am I going to get to take over for me? Nobody's capable of doing what I'm doing. And that's pretty much his point of view. Plus, you got the whole problem with whether they're BT or Cluster. And <laughs> I'm sure he's got, he's got a real problem. Well, and he has no children. No. Because and there's no like children anyway. being born into the Sea Organization, so yeah, you know. And I don't think he cares. I mean, really, I think he's stashed enough money that he really, in the end, doesn't care about anything but his reputation. There was that moment where Tom Cruise said to Nicole Kidman that she knew what she had done when that divorce happened. Do you, you know that when, when she said I, she was out in the press and doing a really good job of beating up on him in terms of the public perception of the, the demise of their marriage and all the sympathy they was pretty much with Nicole Kidman at that time. Yeah. Do you know what happened between the two of them? Why that marriage failed? Was it all just miscavige? I, I, I don't have personal information that I can tell you that, that I, I know what I've heard, but not, not, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't want to be irresponsible about it. Um, yeah. and then I was wondering about the children of celebrities. Are they put somewhere else when in, in the church? Yeah. I mean, celebrity, celebrity, celebrities are very much treated. And it's true for celebrities, no matter where they go, you go to a restaurant, you're going to get treated better than, you know, the normal guy. But in the church, it's, they've got their own, you know, the, the celebrity center and, and, uh, but do those children end up working with you? You mean in the, into the sea organization? Yes. I don't know. I mean, Tommy Davis is an example. He did. And Archer's son. And Archer's son, right. yeah. Um, I don't know what age he got in or that sort of thing. But yeah, they, they can go in. It's not, not any different. Okay. Again, they're treated a little differently. Tommy was at Celebrity Center until the end. Until Miscavige was desperate enough that he had to grab somebody else that could be a public figure and, and put him out there and, until he couldn't take it anymore. And that's what happened. So now that you are out, what do you think, I mean, is, is there, uh, you think that the end of Scientology is coming. What has been, uh, what really prompted you like, to come on our show, to do the film? I mean, why do you feel obligated to say anything? I mean, nobody's paying you. I mean, you're I've not getting anything out of it. I've never right. I don't get anything out of it. And on one hand, I couldn't care except I've got family in that I'd like to see again. I know many, many, many people who have family in that they can't see anymore and that are even not speaking out. And I think they might start now um, because they were worried about further disconnection and that sort of thing. Um, I think that the government has made a huge mistake giving these guys tax exemption and, and making them so protected. Um, and uh, so many people have contacted me that were involved, not involved, and that sort of thing and said, hey, for any of the interviews or anything I've done from the beginning, you know, thank you, it makes a difference. Um, and truly, I got nothing to lose. I mean, I was involved in the thing for, from 12. I came out with, you know, so I go, all right, I'll, I'll uh, if it's the last thing I do, it would be a good thing to see that this church, quote unquote, um, either gets reformed or kicked to the curb because it's not, it is not, uh, it is not a good thing. Well, thank you for visiting with me, yeah, and thank, thank you, you for, for answering me. my questions, um, and, and thanks for doing the film. I think yeah. it's really interesting, and, and I know that it came at some cost to you personally. I mean, every time you do something, the, the, they put, the Scientology organization puts all kinds of PIs, and you've had a, a Look, rough if I, time. If I disappear, you guys know why. Yeah. <laughs> We will come looking for you, okay. and we will make sure that, uh, that we find out what happened to you. I want to thank Tom for being here. I want to invite you all to ask us questions right on the website. He'll be taking a look at it. I'll be answering the questions the best I can. And I want to encourage everyone who's interested at all in the Church of Scientology and what actually happens there. These are really brave people talking about the church, and they do it at, at great personal cost. But be sure to see that film. I think it's a great piece of work that Alex Gibney has done, and I encourage everyone to see it and I am grateful to everybody that appeared in it and we will see you next time on Media Mayhem.